Welcome to On Fire. This is the On Fire podcast. My name is Ryan Allen, and this is episode two of this podcast series. And the title of this podcast is Hear Him. So one of the most common questions I've heard from youth in the church over the years has to do with how they can identify communication from heaven. They they wonder how they can know when the Spirit is speaking to them, and how to discern it from their own thoughts. Uh, I'll admit this is a challenge for many seasoned adult saints as well. Um, I think the challenge comes because communication from heavenly sources are received differently than mortal communication. So mortals on earth normally use speech and writing to communicate, and there's a certain le- there's a certain clarity and and familiarity uh, in these methods of communication for most most of us. They're received through our physical senses and then decoded through our brains. We're less accustomed to receiving communication through our spirit, but that's how they come from heaven. So when we're, when we're children, our parents and teachers teach us how to speak and write, and most of us are, are really spiritual infants and need to learn how to receive communication spiritually. Let's explore the various sources we receive messages from and see if we can get better at understanding who is trying to communicate with us and what they're saying. So this is kind of embarrassing to say because it shows my age, but the first experience I had with using a telephone that wasn't connected to a wall was on my mission. Uh, there, there was one companionship in the mission who had a mobile device. So again, this is back in the late 90s. Uh, so this one companionship had a mobile device, and it was the assistance to the mission president. Uh, the assistant's calling was to help the mission president with pretty much anything that he needed. And in my mission, that involved a lot of traveling to visit different missionaries and sometimes to transport them. When I was called as an assistant to the president, the car I drove had a car phone in it so the mission president could reach us on the road. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, a car phone a car phone was basically a cellular phone, but it was tethered to the car. Uh, you couldn't take it with you. It, it, I, I don't understand exactly why it was kind of a, a larger device, but it, I, I assume it didn't have the battery to operate away from the car, I guess. I think that's why it was tethered to the car. Uh, but anyway, I thought it was truly amazing to be able to talk to someone on the phone while driving in a car. I didn't understand how it worked. I still really don't, uh, but I thought it was cool. So today, most of us have a much more advanced version, a much more capable version of that car phone in our pockets. We can speak or write to people uh, from almost anywhere in the world to almost anywhere in the world. Um, Chances are you're listening to this podcast on just such a device. So how does that work? How can our voices and our writing, our photos, our our videos, uh, how can they be sent invisibly over thousands of miles? Honestly, I don't have a good enough understanding of technology to explain it. So I'm I'm not going to try to answer that question. But it's obviously understood by a lot of people and, and they set it up for the rest of us to use. So maybe this is something you understand and and could explain easily. Uh, Me, not so much. Okay, so in the last podcast, the previous podcasts, I said that you might hear more Star Wars references in in future podcasts. Uh, I'm not going to wait long to make good on that promise. So another Star Wars reference. In A New Hope, Episode 4, uh, we, which we talked about last time a little bit, Luke Skywalker encounters an old Jedi master named Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, Obi-Wan Kenobi um, knew Luke's father before he, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making air quotes, before he died. Um, that's At least that's what Obi-Wan told him. So Luke never knew his father, well, at least in his early, the early part of his life. Obi-Wan and Luke's father, Anakin, were warriors, uh, Jedi knights. Uh, together in their younger days. So in telling Luke about his past, Obi-Wan refers to something called the Force. And Luke asks what the Force is, and Obi-Wan says, The Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Now that, that wasn't actual audio from the movie. That was just me. So just to clarify that part. Um... I know that was bad. In the next movie, 
Uh, it's called The Empire Strikes Back. Luke is being taught by another Jedi Master named Yoda. And Yoda tells Luke about the Force also. Yoda says this, Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Again, that, that was just my voice. That was not, not audio from the actual film. I think that was worse than Obi-Wan, so I apologize. So in this uh, fictional Star Wars universe, there is this force that is described as an energy field that can be accessed by a, a user, a force user, and it enables them to do superhuman things. Okay, so as, as cool as that sounds, the force is not real. I know, I'm disappointed too. However, there is a real essence that the force in some ways resembles. I want to talk about that because it'll help us understand how the Lord communicates with us. Uh, so this is the most common name in the in the scriptures for this is the light of Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the 1970s and 80s, and he wrote this uh, about the light of Christ. There is a spirit, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Christ, the light of truth, the light of Christ, so all, all names for the same thing, that defies description and is beyond mortal comprehension. It is in us and in all things. It is around us and around all things. It fills the earth and the heavens and the universe. It is everywhere, in all immensity, without exception. It is an indwelling, imminent, ever-present, never-absent spirit. It has neither shape nor form nor personality. It is not an entity nor a person nor a personage. It has no agency, does not act independently, and exists not to act but to be acted upon. Okay, so th that's that's kind of what reminded me of the force it's, it, as far as it being in all things and, th and through all things and, and filling uh, the earth and heavens and universe. That's, that's, that's why I drew those, those similarities. Okay, I'm going to continue with um, with Elder McConkie's words here. As far as we know, it has no substance and is not material, at least as we measure things. Joseph Smith taught that all all substances matter, that everything has some sort of matter. So uh, I think it's important to note that, not to disagree with him, but he says at least as we measure these things. So we wouldn't know how to to measure this this essence or energy that he's describing. Okay, continuing on. It is variously described as light and life and law and truth and power. It is the light of Christ. It is the life that is in all things. It is the law by which all things are governed. It is truth shining forth in darkness. It is the power of God who sitteth upon his throne. It may be, and this is, listen carefully to this. I think this warrants some, some pondering. It may be that it is also priesthood and faith and omnipotence. For these two are the power of God. This light of truth or light of Christ is seen in the light of the luminaries of heaven. It is the power by which the sun, moon, and stars, and the earth itself are made. It is the light that proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. It is the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. Even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. It is the agency of God's power. It is the means and way whereby he comprehendeth all things so that all things are before him and all things are around him or round about him. It is the way whereby he is above all things and in all things and is through all things and is round about all things. Because of it, all things are by him and of him, even God forever and ever. Okay. So I know that that was kind of a lot, but, um, uh, but that's his, that's his description of of what we're talking about of of the light of Christ. I'm going to read a little bit more of, of his words here. One more uh, little paragraph from this is from a new witness for the Articles of Faith by Bruce R. McConkie, pages two fifty seven two fifty eight. So this this last part here, we'll finish off. The light of Christ is neither the, is neither the Holy Ghost nor the gift of the Holy Ghost, but that member of the Godhead, because he along with the Father and the Son is God uses the light of Christ for his purposes. Thus, spiritual gifts, the gifts of God, meaning faith, miracles, prophecy, and all the rest, come from God by the power of the Holy Ghost. Men prophesy, for instance, when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and yet Moroni says, all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ. That's Moroni 10.17, meaning that 
the Holy Ghost uses the light of Christ to transmit his gifts. But the Spirit of Christ, by which the Holy Ghost operates, is no more the Holy Ghost himself than the light and heat of the sun are the sun itself. Okay, so th this is kind of complex to understand. I hope you're, I hope you're with me um, and following along with this. The churchofjesuschrist.org um, gospel topic sec section has maybe a slightly more concise description of, of what this is and, and may be helpful to help us understand. So that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from now. The light of Christ is the divine energy, power, or influence that proceeds from God through Christ and gives life and light to all things. The light of Christ influences people for good and prepares them to receive the Holy Ghost. One manifestation of the light of Christ is what we call a conscience. Okay, so your, your conscience is not really your conscience. Your conscience is a manifestation of the light of Christ, of this, this spirit energy that, that we're discussing. Continuing on. The light of Christ proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. I think it's important to note that it, it begins, it proceedeth forth from the presence of God. So this comes from the presence of God and then goes forward to fill the immensity of space. It is the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. And that was, that was from Doctrine and Covenants section 88. That was quoted by Elder McConkie as well. This power is an influence for good in the lives of all people. In the scriptures, the light of Christ is sometimes called the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, or the light of life. The light of Christ should not be confused with the Holy Ghost. It is not a personage as the Holy Ghost is. Its influence leads people to find the true gospel, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Conscience is a manifestation of the light of Christ, enabling us to judge good from evil. The prophet Mormon taught, The Spirit of Christ is given to every man, that he may know good from evil. Wherefore I show unto you the way to judge, for everything which inviteth to do good, and to persuade to believe in Christ, is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. And now, my brethren, seeing that ye know the light by which ye may judge, which light is the light of Christ, see that ye do not judge wrongfully, for with that same judgment which ye judge, ye shall also be judged. I think that just the fact that everyone has a conscience, that everyone is given the light of Christ, everyone in it, just in their heart uh, knows basically good from evil. And that is an evidence for the existence of God. If you've questioned the, whether God exists, if you're not sure, this really is proof of God's existence. There is no biological way to explain why you know good from evil and why you are prone to do good and, and even know the difference. That's it. There's no other explanation than it is put there by, by God. You can't explain that in through, through DNA or through uh, psychology. It is, it is present in your mind. There are things that you just would not do that you're repulsed by because the light of Christ provides, uh, provides direction and helps you know the difference between good and evil. It is evidence of God's existence for sure. And in my mind, it is proof. Okay. So President Boyd K. Packer uh, formerly he was uh, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he said this, Most members of the church have a basic understanding of the Holy Ghost. Most have experienced its promptings and understand why the Holy Ghost is called the Comforter. They know the Holy Ghost is a personage of spirit and a member of the Godhead. But many do not know that there is another spirit, the light of Christ, another source of inspiration which each of us possesses in common with all other members of the human family. If we know about the light of Christ, we will understand that there is something inside all of us and we can appeal to that in our desire to share truth. The Holy Ghost and the light of Christ are different from each other. While they are sometimes described in the scriptures with the same words, they are two different and distinct entities. It is important for you to know about both of them. And I agree with that. That's why I'm taking the time to, to go through this. I want you to understand what the light of Christ is and who the Holy Ghost is and how they're different and how they work together. Going on with President Packer's words, 
The more we know about the light of Christ, the more we will understand about life and the more we will have a deep love for all mankind. We will be better teachers and missionaries and parents and better men and women and children. We will have deeper regard for our brothers and sisters in the church and for those who do not believe and have not yet had conferred upon them the gift of the Holy Ghost. The light of Christ is defined in the scriptures as the spirit which giveth light to every man that cometh into the world. The light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. Doctrine and Covenants 88 again being quoted there. And the light of Christ is also described in the scriptures as the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of truth, the light of truth, the spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit. Some of these terms are also used to refer to the Holy Ghost. The First Presidency has written, There is a universally diffused essence, which is the light and the life of the world, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, which proceedeth forth from the presence of God throughout the immensity of space, the light and power of which God bestows in different degrees to them that ask him, according to their faith and obedience. We are admonished to quench not the spirit. Thus we can see that all are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil. They have their agency and they are accountable. The Spirit of Christ fosters everything that is good, every virtue. It stands in brilliant, indestructible opposition to anything that is coarse or ugly or profane or evil or wicked. Conscience affirms the reality of the Spirit of Christ in man. It affirms as well the reality of good and evil, of justice, mercy, honor, courage, faith, love, and virtue, as well as the necessary opposites, hatred, greed, brutality, jealousy. Such values, though physically intangible, respond to, to laws with cause and effect relationships as certain as any resulting from physical laws. The Spirit of Christ can be likened unto a guardian angel for every person. The Spirit of Christ can enlighten the inventor, the scientist, the painter, the sculptor, the composer, the performer, the architect, the author to produce great, even inspired things for the blessing and good of all mankind. I think that's really important to note that that this ent this essence, this entity, that not not an entity, but this this essence and spirit can enlighten all sorts of people to do things that will benefit mankind and has and has been used to help further technology that enables the Lord to more effectively do his work and communicate and have us communicate with each other and, and so forth. Okay, going on with President Packer's words here. The spirit can prompt the farmer in his field and the fisherman on his boat. It can inspire the teacher in the classroom, the missionary in presenting his discussion. It can inspire the student who listens, and of enormous importance, it can inspire husband and wife and father and mother. This inner light can warn and guard and guide, but it can be repulsed by anything that is ugly or unworthy or wicked or immoral or selfish. And by ugly, it's not talking about a physical appearance. It's talking about something that would be offensive to the spirit, something that is synonymous with those other words, unworthy, wicked, or immoral or selfish. Okay, the light of Christ existed in you before you were born, and it will be with you every moment that you live and will not perish when the mortal part of you has turned to dust. It is ever there. Every man, woman, and child of every nation, creed, or color, everyone, no matter where they live or what they believe or what they do, has within them the imperishable light of Christ. In this respect, all men are created equally. The light of Christ in everyone is a testimony that God is no respecter of persons. He treats everyone equally in that endowment with the light of Christ. To describe the light of Christ, I will compare or liken the light of the or compare or liken it to the light of the sun. Sunlight is familiar to everyone. It is everywhere present and can be seen and can be felt. Life itself depends upon sunlight. The light of Christ is like sunlight. It too is everywhere present and given to everyone equally. Just as darkness must vanish when the light of the sun appears, so is evil sent fleeing by the light of Christ. There is no darkness in sunlight. Darkness is subject unto it. The sun can be hidden by clouds or by the rotation of the earth, but the clouds will disappear and the earth will complete its turning. Okay, so we know what the light of Christ is now. Why is that important? For me, it's helpful to understand the how, understanding how Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost can send me a message or a prompting is useful. Um, it's also helpful to understand to some extent how miracles are performed and how 
how worlds are created. Jehovah, or Jesus Christ, Jehovah is his pre-mortal name. Jesus Christ commands through this energy or essence, and the elements obey and organize themselves according to his direction. I love at least being able to have some sort of understanding about how creation takes place, how how people can be healed through priesthood blessings. Uh, and that is basically the commanding of element to organize or to disorganize or to, to move. And element listens to someone who possesses power like Jesus Christ or someone who Jesus Christ has authorized to speak on his behalf. So sometimes promptings come to us as, as words and sometimes they come to us as feelings the heavenly sender can can kind of customize the message for us in, in whatever way is going to be best received by us. I believe that Jesus Christ is constantly sending promptings to each of us. It's called the light of Christ or spirit of Christ, I assume, because he's the primary user of it. So what's the difference between receiving a prompting from the Holy Ghost and from Christ? We talk a lot in the church about the Holy Ghost giving promptings. But I I wonder if we mistakenly attribute all of it to him when it's more likely Jesus reaching out to us. Personally, I don't, I don't think they care much about that. They're, they aren't jealous of one another. It doesn't really matter to them, but I prefer to know who's speaking to me. Um, We can differentiate by understanding the roles of the Holy Ghost. So let's talk about that a little bit. This is from churchofjesuschrist.org gospel topics under Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the third member of the Godhead. He is a personage of spirit without a body of flesh and bones. He is often referred to as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, or the Comforter. You'll notice that some of those titles are the same as as the Light of Christ's uh, other titles or other names, and so that, that can be confusing. We have to look at some of the scriptures in context to see if it's talking about the person of the Holy Ghost or, uh, or the or the light of Christ, that can be kind of tricky. But it and it doesn't totally matter. I mean, it's the Holy Ghost works through the light of Christ, so sometimes it's just synonymous. But anyway, let's talk about the roles of the Holy Ghost. This is back to uh, the gospel topics. The Holy Ghost works in perfect unity with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, fulfilling several roles to help us live righteously and receive the blessings of the gospel. Okay, so these are the roles of the Holy Ghost. And and to me, this is what makes it easy to distinguish between the light of Christ and the Holy Ghost. Okay, the Holy Ghost, it says, he witnesses of the Father and the Son. So let's put an emphasis there on witness. He he witnesses of the Father and the Son. He, he gives testimony of the Father and the Son. And reveals and teaches the truth of all things. Okay, so those there's three really important words in that in that sentence. Witnesses, reveals, and teaches. So when you receive a witness that something is true, that that is from the Holy Ghost. When something is revealed to you, something that you didn't know that is revealed, that is from the Holy Ghost. When when you are taught something, he he teaches the truth of all things. If you're taught something through the Spirit that you did not know, uh, that's the Holy Ghost. We can receive a sure testimony of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ only by the power of the Holy Ghost. His communication to our spirit carries far more certainty than any communication we can receive through our natural senses. So I I think that's a really important point. And, And as you consider your own testimony, you need to look at that and see where that's come from. We can see evidence of this in the Book of Mormon, right? Can't we? Laman and Lemuel, for example, are are visited by an angel. They hear his voice. They see him. But it doesn't change them. And it doesn't last like a witness from the Holy Ghost can. Uh, A witness from the Holy Ghost is is really what, for, for anyone who believes, really, that's the foundation. That's why... We believe because it's been imprinted on our on our spirit. It's more powerful and more lasting than something we would receive through our physical sentence or senses, even seeing an angel or even seeing the Lord. Okay, going on with the going on with the gospel topics on the Holy Ghost from the church website. 
As we strive to stay on the path that leads us that leads to eternal life, the Holy Ghost can guide us in our decisions and protect us from physical and spiritual danger. Through him, we can receive gifts of the Spirit for our benefit and for the benefit of those we love and serve. He is the comforter. So that's that's one of his roles, and that's something that's different. He He comforts us. As the soothing voice of a loving parent can quiet a crying child, the whisperings of the Spirit can calm our fears, hush the nagging worries of our life, and comfort us when we grieve. The Holy Ghost can fill us with hope and perfect love and teach us the peaceable things of the kingdom. Through his power, we are sanctified as we repent, receive the ordinances of baptism and confirmation, and remain true to our covenants. I think that's something we need to understand, that the power through the power of the Holy Ghost, we're sanctified as we repent. He is able to dwell in us, and uh, can kind of act as, as a cleansing agent. He can enter into us and and burn out that's that fire right he he can come in and burn out our impurities and sanctify us so that we're pure in our in our spirit okay he is the holy spirit of promise in this capacity he confirms that the priesthood ordinances we have received and the covenants we have made are acceptable to god this approval depends on our continued faithfulness so that's another one of his roles is to act as the holy spirit of promise basically to to confirm and to ratify the priesthood ordinances that we receive. So if someone's baptized and they're insincere about it, uh, it's of no efficacy. It's of, it's, it's not valid. Um, if they're, if it's not sealed by the Holy spirit of promise and, and he would know our heart and our thoughts and be able to tell that. Okay. So what is the difference between the gift of the Holy ghost and, and just the Holy ghost and his influence? Let's look at that. This is again from the, the church website. All honest seekers of of the truth can feel the influence of the Holy Ghost, leading them to Jesus Christ and his gospel. However, the fullness of the blessings given through the Holy Ghost are available only to those who receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and remain worthy. After a person is baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, one or more Melchizedek priesthood holders lay their hands on the person's head and in a sacred priesthood ordinance confirm him or her a member of the church. As part of this ordinance called confirmation, the person is given the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is different from the influence of the Holy Ghost. Before baptism, a person can feel the influence of the Holy Ghost from time to time and through that influence can receive a testimony of the truth. After receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, a person has the right to the constant companionship of that member of the Godhead if he or she keeps the commandments. The people in the Book of Mormon who were visited by Jesus after his resurrection understood through the light of Christ that the gift of the Holy Ghost was extremely important for them. Uh, in fact, it, it was what they desired most of all. And they had just been in the presence of the resurrected Savior, but that's what they wanted. So this is from Third Nephi 19, starting in verse 8. And when they had ministered those same words which Jesus had spoken, this is talking about the 12, the 12 ministered those same words nothing varying from the words which jesus had spoken behold they knelt again and prayed to the father in the name of jesus and they did pray for that which they most desired and they desired that the holy ghost should be given unto them and it came to pass when they were all baptized and had come up out of the water the holy ghost did fall upon them and they were filled with the holy ghost and with fire oh here we go again if you if you missed the last episode we talked about uh, the name of this podcast being on fire. And we talked about spiritual fire. So here's another example. This is verse 14. And behold, they were encircled about as if it were by fire. And it came down from heaven and the multitude did witness it and did bear record. And angels did come down out of heaven and did minister unto them. Okay, that's awesome. There's another example of fire um, as a manifestation of God's spirit and power. All right, so we've shown that the Godhead can communicate with our spirits through the channel of, of the Spirit or the light of Christ. What other voices are there that can influence us? Okay, one more Star Wars reference, and I'll stop it for now. Okay, so he, Yoda is training Luke Skywalker and, and gives this warning. He says, But beware of the dark side. Anger, fear, aggression. The dark side of the Force are they. Easily they flow, quick to join you in a fight. Is the dark side stronger? Luke asks. No, no, no. Quicker, easier, more seductive. 
I think that was worse. My voice is getting kind of hoarse, and and that was a worse Yoda than the first, the first attempt. So, my apologies. Okay, well there there's no there's no dark side of the light of Christ. So, what is the source of our temptations and evil thoughts? So let's let President Wilfred Woodruff, um, who was was uh, was the fourth president of the church in this dispensation, this is what he wrote about that. There are two powers on the earth and in the midst of the inhabitants of the earth, the power of God and the power of the devil. When God has had a people on the earth, it matters not in what age, Lucifer, the son of the morning, and the millions of fallen spirits that were cast out of heaven have warred against God, against Christ, against the work of God, and against the people of God, and they are not backward in doing it in our day and generation. Whenever the Lord has set his hand to perform any work, those powers labored to overthrow it. I think his his number might be conservative, millions of fallen spirits. I think it's it's a large number. It's a third part of the hosts of heaven. Not necessarily one third per se, but but a third part. So it's a large number of those fallen spirits that were cast out of heaven. There's a, a fantastic uh, Enzyme article from April of 2017. It's from Elder Larry R. Lawrence, and it's called The War Goes On. So referencing the war in heaven, he writes this, Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven, but they were not sent immediately to outer darkness. First, they were sent to this earth, where Jesus Christ was to be born and where his atoning sacrifice would be carried out. Why were Satan's hosts allowed to come to earth? They came to provide opposition for those who are being tested here. Will they eventually be cast into outer darkness? Yes. After the millennium, Satan and his hosts will be cast out forever. The war that began in heaven continues to this day. In fact, the battle is heating up as the saints prepare for the return of the Savior. Then Elder Lawrence gives these strategies, Satan's strategies. So this is how he, he works, and this is what why it's relevant to our topic of, of being able to hear him, uh, being able to hear the Savior. So there's these other voices. So Satan's strategies, one, temptation. The devil is brazen when it comes to putting wicked ideas into our minds. The Book of Mormon teaches that Satan whispers unclean and unkind thoughts and sows thoughts of doubt. He nags us to act on addictive urges and to entertain selfishness and greed. He doesn't want us to recognize where these ideas are coming from, so he whispers, I am no devil, for there is none. A second strategy is lies and deception. The scriptures reveal that Satan is the father of lies. Don't believe him when he whispers messages such as, You never do anything right. You are too sinful to be forgiven. You will never change. No one cares about you and you have no talents. Another of his oft-used lies is the following, you need to try everything at least once just to gain experience. One time won't hurt you. The dirty little secret that he doesn't want you to know is that sin is addictive. Okay, so that's that's the end of Elder Lawrence's quote there. So we can see that we basically have two main sources seeking to influence our thoughts. The Godhead, or, or it could be an angel sent by the Godhead, and the devil and his minions. So often, a heavenly message is sent, and as soon as those dark ones detect it, they try to counter it with a conflicting message. Satan and his minions are constantly opposing God and battling against all that is good. So often we hear their voices in our minds as maybe excuses or, or arguments as to why we should not follow a prompting from God. We might hear stuff like, it's too late. Don't be lame. He doesn't deserve your help. Uh, it's not your problem. Probably most frequently, you're too tired, right? Maybe you're too tired to pray. He tries to convince you of that. You don't have time. You don't have time to serve someone else. You don't have time to attend this meeting or go to this activity. Satan and, and his dark angels can't read our thoughts but they're very practiced at reading cues and and reading our reactions. I think they can detect light coming to us and they're repulsed by it, but they know it's happening. And so they take that as their cue to act. Okay, so those those are are two two sources. So the third voice that we hear in our minds is our own thoughts. So uh, we can 
differentiate our own thoughts from other sources because that that voice in our in our head that's our own is usually weighing the options and asking questions. So we're the voice that we hear in our head that's ours is saying, "What should I do?" or "Do I have time?" or "Is that bad?" or "What will other people think?" We're, we're capable of of generating both good and evil thoughts on our own, and and we do, but we're frequently influenced by outside sources. So hopefully by understanding the origins of those unseen sources seeking to influence us, we can make better choices when it comes to choosing who we're going to listen to and, and who we're going to obey. President Russell M. Nelson in his April 2020 general conference talk that was titled Hear Him said this, The adversary is clever. For millennia he has been making good look evil and evil look good. His messages tend to be loud, bold, bold, and boastful. However, messages from our Heavenly Father are strikingly different. He communicates simply, quietly, and with such stunning plainness that we cannot misunderstand Him. Our Father knows that when we are surrounded by uncertainty and fear, what will help us the very most is to hear His Son. Because when we seek to hear, truly hear, His Son, we will be guided to know what to do in any circumstance. The very first word in the Doctrine and Covenants is hearken. It means to listen with the intent to obey. To hearken means to hear him, to hear what the Savior says, and then to heed his counsel. In those two words, hear him, God gives us the pattern for success, happiness, and joy in this life. We are to hear the words of the Lord, hearken to them, and heed what he has told us. As we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, our efforts to hear him need to be ever more intentional. It takes conscious and consistent effort to fill our daily lives with his words, his teachings, his truths. We also hear him more clearly as we refine our ability to recognize the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. Uh, let me put some emphasis on this next sentence. It has never been more imperative to know how the Spirit speaks to you than right now. In the Godhead, the Holy Ghost is the messenger. He will bring thoughts to your mind which the Father and son want you to receive. He is the comforter. He will bring a feeling of peace to your heart. He testifies of truth and will confirm what is true as you hear and read the words of the Lord. I renew my plea for you to do whatever it takes to increase your spiritual capacity to receive personal revelation. I want to add my testimony to President Nelson's. It has never been more important, more critical to recognize and act upon the words of Jesus Christ and the promptings of the Holy Ghost than right now, today. You need to know that the Godhead wants to speak with you, wants to help you. They want to help you and lift and guide you. Remove from your life the noise that drowns out the still small voice of the Spirit. Don't, don't let yourself become immersed in a, in a constant stream of entertainment. Just be still sometimes. Be in a, in a quiet setting periodically without distraction so that the channel of revelation can be clear. I'll make you this promise. If you will sincerely pray to be able to better hear him, he'll teach you how, how to, how to hear him better. If you will immediately act on the promptings that you receive, you will receive more. And as you practice discerning communications from light sources, from dark sources, you'll be more and more difficult for the devils to deceive. And, and oh boy, are they trying to do that. And we're going to talk more about that in the next podcast, about this war that started in heaven and continues today. These truly are the last days, and the Lord needs you to hearken to his words so that he can navigate you safely through them and so you can bless others. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.